the burden of I IBD is increasing on the NHS uh, year on year, and the costs over a lifetime are rapidly becoming comparable to cancer and diabetes. Um, and not only is that um, a huge challenge for the NHS, uh, but if we don't tackle the issue of earlier diagnosis, more joined up care and, and, uh, and the best practice standards across the country, we really uh, run the risk of losing out for a whole variety, especially of younger people who will uh, be prevented by their condition from uh, living the sorts of full and productive lives that, that we want them to. So it's a serious condition and it needs serious action. So this report is really only the beginning. Um, across the UK, governments have got to take uh, IBD seriously and make it a priority. And we'd like governments to communicate a clear strategy of how they tend, intend to improve care for that half a million people who live with this complex and debilitating condition. Uh, and we'd like them to do that soon and lay out a plan for the next five years. This report, I, I hope, is only the beginning and that all of us can use it uh, and the valuable insights that it gives to get recognition of the condition and to get better government attention in all four nations. But if I can first of all um, ask uh, Sarah Sleet, who's Chair of IBD UK and Chief Executive of Crohn's and Colitis UK, to give us an overview of the report's findings and recommendations. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and thank you for an insightful introduction there. Um, I want to, first of all, just say something about the authors of the report, IBD UK. So if we can just go on to the next slide, and we, we, we were just saying earlier, we're going to have to do that classic thing of next slide, next slide throughout uh, this evening. So I hope you can bear with us. Um, the IBD UK is really a, an amazing collaboration of all of the key stakeholders. Um, who want to drive quality in IBD care. So we have 17 organisations representing all of the clinical disciplines involved in that care, but also importantly, patient associations as well. And we are a partnership of equals who have um, come together to really try and identify what quality care looks like, both from a clinical perspective, but also critically from a patient perspective. And then to assess in terms of the services in the UK, how we're matching up to that um, standard. And I just want to particularly thank everybody involved in this report, because obviously the last year has been unbelievable uh, for many people. And yet um, the people who are involved in these organisations and in producing this report for tonight have carried on throughout this year um, in spite of COVID keeping their commitment to seeing um, consistent, safe, high quality, personalized care for IBD um, as a really critical mission for this group, um, for everybody, wherever they live in the UK. So thank you um, for making tonight happen. Um, it's been many years in the making. So next slide, please. Um, I know that uh, many of you, of course, uh, on this call will know very well what IBD is and what it means to live with IBD. Um, so I'm not going to go into to detail about that, but I do just want to highlight that second bullet point. Half a million people in the UK live with IBD. If we've been talking about this only a year or two ago, we would have been talking about figures of around 300,000 because that's all we knew at the time. But it turns out we've been vastly underestimating the number of people living with this condition. And recent research over the last year or so has um, demonstrated that it's at least 500,000. And we will be getting UK figures very shortly, which shows um, how that pans out across the UK. But what does that mean in terms of services? Because services have actually been built on a much lower prevalence figure than we know, know, now know about. And perhaps that explains the pressure that some of those services are under and the um, sometimes um, patchy nature in terms of what those services can deliver when you think about the numbers involved. So next slide, please. 
So I just want to talk about um, what has um, formed the basis of this report. And it is a unique approach, I believe, in terms of any disease area. Critically, we have um, the clinical services and their assessment of how their services are doing against the IBD standards. Um, we had 166 services across the UK respond. That's nearly three quarters of all IBD services in the UK, which shows first of all, the commitment of those services to, to improvement and quality, but also their endorsement of this approach has been a really robust and comprehensive survey um, in terms of standards. The other element which really forms this total 360 degree view of how services are doing is asking what the service user thinks of that service in terms of standards. And we had over 10,000 people reporting um, and those 10,000 people actually represent 99% of the services in the UK. So this is the most comprehensive study of IBD um, quality in services um, that's been undertaken to date, and it is a genuinely unique approach. So what did we find? Well, if we move on to the next slide, four critical themes come through. The first one is about diagnosis um, and the rather shocking figure here still that one in four people are waiting more than a year to get diagnosed. And the impact on the individual is obviously um, tremendous. The not knowing what your symptoms are about, the anxiety associated with that, the um, often worsening the experience of those symptoms. I think it's almost incalculable, um, the effect on the individual, but there's also an effect on our services because we know that 40% um, of people are actually visiting A&E before they get diagnosed. And even more startlingly, one in 10 have three or more visits before they get diagnosed. I wonder if we were able to have earlier diagnosis, whether all of those visits and all of that additional pressure on NHS services could have been avoided if we got that early diagnosis piece right. And the other element that comes very clearly through here, but is threaded through the entire experience of people with um, Crohn's and colitis, is the information or rather the absence of information too often for people at the really critical point that they need it. Nearly a third of people said that they weren't offered any information when diagnosed. Now think of the, the stress, um, the anxiety of getting that diagnosis and not being provided with further information. Surely a simple thing to rectify. Next slide, please. The second um, theme is about personalised care and support for self-management. Anybody who's worked in, in health will know that these are two areas that have been shown time and time again for people with long-term care, uh, long-term conditions, sorry. Um, but if you have these elements right, it is so much easier to live with the condition. It is your quality of experience is so much better. But we are showing very patchy experience across the, the UK. We know that IBD affects way more than just your gut and it's way more than just about medications. Um, fatigue is a really important issue in IBD and yet only half of patients are asked about that issue. We know that 60% um, are not asked about their emotional well-being, and yet it's so important to how they're dealing with the condition. And, um, you know, nearly a third are not asked about, about pain. Again, another critical element of living with IBD. And if you're not being asked about it, those issues are not being addressed in your care. And I suppose, is it any wonder that nearly 90% of people have said that they found it hard to cope in the last year, um, given that so much of their well-being and care is not necessarily being addressed in a consistent way. So moving on to the next slide and the third theme that comes from the report, uh, fast, faster access to specialist care. 
we know that IBD is a relapsing remitting condition. And when you flare, actually having fast access to specialist advice can either reduce the impact of that flare or um, certainly make sure that the worst effects are avoided. But too often people are not getting that quick and easy access, sometimes because they don't know how to get the access and sometimes because the, the routes in are convoluted and inaccessible anyway. So as a result of lack of access, is it, I suppose, any wonder that there are so many emergency admissions? Um, nearly three quarters of the stays that people have in hospital in the last 12 months were emergency admissions. That's certainly not good for the patient. And again, I wonder how good that is for the NHS. So it's really important that we get on top of this issue and make sure that people know what to do, can get access to specialist care as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. And then the final um, theme is about multidisciplinary working. And it's particularly important in IBD because of this wide range of symptoms, these wide range of impacts that people have living with the condition, that they need to have access to a wide range of expertise in the NHS. And this is probably one of the biggest gaps that we see um, in the report. In terms of um, the standards, IBD specialist nurses, um, it's well known that they are so important to quality of experience and care um, of IBD services. And yet only 14% of services are reporting matching the standards for the numbers of nurses. And there are so many other um, critical disciplines which are not accessible to people. Um, not enough psychologists, not enough dietitians, not enough pharmacists, and on it goes. And equally, the care um, coordination, given that there is so little access to the range of teams, um, that coordination of care is that much harder. So we need fully resourced teams to really deliver excellent care. Next slide, please. So what do we need to happen? Well, we have come together as clinicians and as patients, and we have worked on what good care looks like, and we've assessed the services. And we have seen so many examples of things really well done. But unfortunately, often they're too isolated. Um, they're, um, you know, it's a bit of a postcode lottery in terms of what you can uh, access. So to make system change, what we really need is for governments across the UK to make IBD a priority and to ensure that there is a proper strategy with clear targets over the next five years to make a difference. Patients and clinicians are lined up to do this, but have we got the governments there to back it? Final slide, please. So our take home message is we really need governments to match uh, that leadership. Pre-COVID, there were already major gaps in IBD care. We've been through um, a huge knock to the NHS, which has um, you know, unbelievably come through the last year, but we know that attention has been taken away too often for many conditions, um, long-term conditions in the NHS, and those cracks are widening. What we need to do is genuinely to build back better, to take on board the messages from this report and for government to take leadership. And we as a community of patients and clinicians need to hold governments to account to make sure they deliver on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, we're going to move on now to hear from Anisha Gangotra, who's living with ulcerative colitis and is going to share her personal experiences. Anisha. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me this evening to share my story um, with you all, which will really bring to life on a very personal level the importance of this report and its findings in improving and shaping IBD care for the future. So, I've lived with ulcerative colitis for over 13 years. My first symptoms occurred in 2008 at the age of 24. And I noticed blood in my stool, so I went to the GP. 
And over two years, I had many appointments, saw different consultants at different hospitals, um, and all with varying degrees of quality of care. Uh, so my first colonoscopy that I had was very difficult and painful. Uh, the correct procedures weren't followed, which I only realized after I later experienced what good practice should look like. And over those two years, I lost a lot of weight. And at one point I weighed around 30, sorry, 38 kilos. Um, I struggled to eat and I was often in the toilet up to 20 times a day, doubled over in pain. I had numerous accidents in public where I couldn't make it to toilet facilities in time. I was losing blood, my sleep was affected, and I just felt constantly exhausted. And this affected all areas of my life, including my work, my hobbies, and my social life. And also my mental health was affected, which I was given very little support with. And I honestly felt like I'd been pushed from pillar to post over those two years with a variety of prognoses, no clear information, support, or a plan for how to manage my health. And it was not only a difficult time for me, but also for my family who could, you know, they could really see the devastating impact that this condition was having on me. So I had been under the care of my local hospital, which didn't have specialist IBD services. And eventually I moved to a hospital uh, based in London that did have specialist IBD services. And despite it being a 90 mile round trip by car, I moved under their care in 2010 and was finally given an official diagnosis. And I remember being told that there was no cure and that I would have to live with the condition for the rest of my life. And I cried. I cried with despair at the thought of having to live the rest of my life as I had been for the past two years. But a part of me also cried with relief at finally being given a diagnosis and feeling like I'd been listened to and believed and that it wasn't all in my head. And I believe two years was too long to receive a diagnosis and the impact on my daily life throughout that time was immense. Now, since moving to the hospital in London, I have access to IBD nurses as well as IBD consultants. And this has been a game changer for how quickly I can access supported guidance regarding flares. So when my symptoms are active or any questions on medication or any other advice that I need that may affect my IBD. Now, I spent five months traveling in South America and my IBD nurse was my first port of call to discuss how to manage my IBD safely and effectively whilst traveling. And this really gave me peace of mind, reassurance and necessary specialist advice to enable me to do something that I'd always wanted to do and make a dream come true. And I don't believe I should have to forego my dreams because I live with this condition or because the right support isn't available. So through the support and guidance of the IBD nurses, I've also learned how to self-manage where appropriate. So for example, I know when my symptoms are getting worse because I've learned what to look out for and I can take responsibilities for making some decisions because I have appropriate knowledge and awareness that I've learned through the expertise of the nurses. So for example, taking an antispasmodic medication to help with stomach cramps, or if I need to alter my diet if I'm in a flare. And these are immediate decisions that I can make to manage my symptoms, which helps me to feel that I'm taking control of my health. The IBD nurses are a vital support network for patients and the backbone of services. And I know I can call the IBD help helpline and speak to an IBD nurse. And this bridges the gap between accessing my GP, who isn't an IBD specialist, and trying to access an IBD consultant. And this gives me huge peace of mind knowing the support is there whenever I need it, given that IBD is an unpredictable condition. Now, the report very clearly highlights that IBD is a condition that can affect a person in many different ways. 
So having access to holistic care and a multidisciplinary team is key to being able to manage the condition effectively and in a person-centered way. So I've accessed dietitians, ENT, mental health professional, professionals, and rheumatology. Now I'm an educated university graduate and I'm an engaged health literate patient. However, even I've struggled at times as the services haven't always been joined up or easy to access. However, it's not just enough to have the services there. They need to be able to provide appropriate care to the diverse population they serve. For example, I've seen many dietitians over the years and there have been at times where I've honestly felt that the appointment was a bit of a waste of time because they had no understanding of an Indian diet and food despite the hospital being based in a very diverse area with a high Asian population. And so we're actually unable to support me appropriately. And there are also areas such as fatigue management, which Sarah very clearly highlighted, which is one of my most debilitating symptoms and has had the biggest impact on my quality of life and mental health, and where I've really struggled to access support. And this is because overall there is little available and it's an area where more needs to be done to support patients. But it's really important to highlight that fatigue is more than just being a bit tired. I mean, can you imagine waking up after eight hours of sleep and feeling like you've actually been awake for 48 hours and you've run a marathon? Or can you imagine feeling like you're wading through mud wearing shoes filled with concrete? Or can you imagine the feeling in your head of trying to do complex mental arithmetic, but actually all you're trying to work out is, do I need to brush my teeth first or do I need to get dressed first? And this is what it's like to live with fatigue. The body is exhausted and so is the mind. And it's honestly the most frustrating feeling in the world. And this is my daily life. Now, for the first 10 years of living with colitis, the longest period of remission that I'd ever achieved in between flares and having active symptoms was six months. And this has been an exhausting cycle, both physically on my body and mentally. And I've had to learn how to try and live my life whilst being unwell for the majority of the past 10 years. Day to day, I rely on family support for tasks such as shopping and cleaning to enable me to do other things such as work or exercise or some of the sort of nice to do things such as seeing a friend. And every day is different and unpredictable. There are some days when I can do things and other days where I can't as the pain or fatigue is overwhelming. And this has at times led me to be basically feeling lonely and isolated and hugely frustrated. And I would never have imagined that I would be in my 30s and relying on my parents or my family for support with day-to-day -day tasks, particularly as they get older and have their own health conditions to manage. And it also means that I worry about the future and how I will be able to cope. In terms of work, out of a total of 15 years of my career so far, I spent 13 of them living with IBD. And I do worry that I may not be able to work in the future if my symptoms are not well controlled, particularly my fatigue. And I've worried about moving jobs and how to disclose my condition to employers for fear of discrimination. And I have unfortunately actually experienced discrimination in the past. Now, employment is important for so many reasons, but especially for financial independence, because there is an economic impact to living with IBD. I have spent thousands of pounds over the years on prescription medications, um, and there's no guarantee that that medication will work. I have the cost of traveling to and from medical appointments, which can at times be 60 pounds per trip. But I'm also reluctant to move my care closer to home because I can't guarantee that I will receive the same services and standards of care. And the cost of other treatments, which may be beneficial, but aren't available on the NHS. Now, I just want to very briefly touch upon culture. I'm very aware of, of time um, and how limited we are this evening. 
But there does continue to be stigma and discrimination in wider society attached to having a chronic illness or disability. And as a British Asian woman, there's particular stigma in South Asian communities. And much of that is due to fear around what it means for a person's day-to-day -day life and their future prospects, which can make it even more challenging living with IBD. My immediate family and I have been very open with each other about discussing health issues, and we've always been supportive of one another. However, outside of the family and the community, we've experienced stigma and ignorance. You know, I've heard people say that living with a chronic illness or disability means that you've done something bad in a previous life and that it's your karma, essentially implying that the illness is your fault. And this can make accessing services and support challenging and it's important that services are delivered in a culturally aware and sensitive way. So in conclusion, managing my IBD, it often feels like a full-time job. I don't get a day off from living with colitis and it's exhausting. I don't just want to survive living with colitis, I want to be able to thrive. And I choose to live positively with IBD and its challenges, but everything I do on a daily basis takes into consideration the fact that I live with this disease. And whilst progress in care has been made since my first symptoms back in 2008, there is still a way to go in improving infrastructure, shaping IBD services for the future, and developing true patient-centered care. And the findings and recommendations in this IBD national report are crucial to achieving this. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my story this evening. Thank you, Anisha. It's, um, that really brings home just how important the contents of this report is for people like you right across the four nations uh, who need better care, quite frankly. So let's hear from Catherine Edwards. Dr. Catherine Edwards is a consultant gastroenterologist in Torbay. She's uh, the immediate past president of the uh, British Society of Gastroenterology and registrar elect for the Royal College of Physicians. And Catherine's going to talk about the power of collaboration to make a difference. Catherine. Thank you very much, Barbara. And, and first, thank you, Anisha, for that very powerful narrative uh, around your experience. Now, I've got a technical problem and I've just lost my screen view. So I can just want to do a quick sound check with you, Barbara, that you can still yep. hear me. I can hear you fine. Fine. OK, so I can't see my slides, but I'll, I'll talk uh, to the three slides that I've prepared now. And I'd like to start by uh, saying that it seems a good point just to reflect uh, over the IBD collaborative journey and the factors that have created the most impact in those collaborations in a time frame that's going to mirror the period of uh, Anisha's uh, diagnosis. Now, this audience will be very familiar with this timeline, looking back to 15 years of national IBD audit, mapping the true collaborative initiatives, focusing on clinical standards, quality improvement, data collection, and data systems. And this is a period of time which has seen the evolution of collaboration, although some might question the pace of change in the outcomes from those collaborative efforts. I'd like to suggest to you, however, that the pandemic, as it's mirrored and unveiled so much uh, of our understanding about medical service provision, has actually gave us, given us an opportunity as the IBD community to work highly effectively and at pace in a collaborative effort to bring a safe and secure way of trying to support patients with IBD during the pandemic. And perhaps a good example of this was the web tool that was developed uh, in 2020 to allow patients living with the disease to upload data and to personalize their risk for COVID-19. And this data was then linked in a secure fashion to secondary care services and to government agencies. Next slide, please. But possibly more importantly still over this, is, over this time has been the realization that it's the collaboration between patient and healthcare professional communities that can deliver most benefit. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think we all realize that in a resource constricted system, choices have to be made about priorities in care. And 
in order to understand where most impact on people's lives can be made, we need to listen to the patient priorities for holistic care delivery. And I think these facts, which reiterate some of the messages coming out of the benchmarking uh, uh, survey, um, help us to understand and demonstrate very well that in fact, the desired impact from our collaborations wouldn't be that difficult to achieve if we focus and prioritize communication. It struck me very much that patients felt under-informed and under-supported in terms of information availability. Next slide, please. And it's not, that communication is not just about uh, between the patient and the professional community, but it's between and within services. And again, I think this helps us understand how good communications between specialists, again alluded to by Anisha, that communication between the various subspecialty service providers within the MDT is driven by that communication piece. The effectiveness of the MBT, MDT is driven by good communication. And secondly, of course, Sarah pointed out that unless we communicate between primary and secondary care, between our acute services uh, and, and our patients, then we see the impact of poor preventative care on the acute services, which are so heavily stressed, particularly during COVID-19 times. So finally, I'd just like to conclude by saying the reason that this collaborative study and report is so important is that I think it reminds us all that through that collaboration, we can actually begin to mandate a national holistic service for patients, which reduces social inequality. And again, Anisha spoke a little bit to this uh, agenda in the final part of cultural sensitivity. And it provides us uh, uh, a system by which we can contribute to, which gives equity of access for all patients, regardless of their geographic location, whether that be north versus south resourcing, rural versus urban, or indeed our difficult to access patient groupings in our society. So I think Barbara, at this point, um, I will uh, stop and ask everyone to hold that thought about equitable access to service as we now go on and listen to examples of service models and innovation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, we're now going on to three quick interventions from speakers from across the UK who will speak about embedding the IBD standards in service delivery. First of all, Barney Hawthorne's consultant gastroenterologist in Cardiff and the IBD clinical lead for the, for, for the NHS Wales Health Collaborative, and he's going to talk about improving IBD care in Wales. Thank you very much, um, Barbara. Um, the Welsh Government in, in March 2019 held an, a national IBD workshop and out of that arose a national framework for action in Wales and the formation, if I could have the next slide um, and the next one. Thank you. Um, 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 formed an IBD working group um, that was under the aegis of the, the Wales Health Collaborative, um, which the, that organisation has a remit for um, improving quality of services across boundaries. And um, the working group was um, liaising with an pre-existing uh, IBD Wales um, committee which represents all specialist groups and health boards and patients covering the whole of Wales. And that's really important. And if I could have the next slide. Um, the current plans are a service baseline exercise and that's going to be, has already been informed by the data from the benchmarking survey and supplemented by current data on activity, uh, waiting times, and uh, manpower levels in the different health boards. Um, and we have targeted four areas. 
that we think are key for service development. And they're shown here in this slide. The first is the um, development of local IBD teams, which comprise a senior clinician, a nurse, and a manager. And they have a key role both in um, organizing business meetings um, and running quality assurance cycles for their service. IBD MDTs, I think, need beefing up. They need to be more akin to cancer MDTs. They need to have admin support so they're minuted and there are auditable outcomes. And we can't talk about teams without talking about the specialist nurses, their vital role. We've done a recent survey of all the IBD nurses in Wales. Um, and uh, despite recent expansion, our numbers of nurses are still well below that recommended uh, by the IBD standards. And when we look at the, their job plans, 20% of what they do is actually non-IBD, uh, mostly endoscopy. And it's important to remember that when we're looking at numbers. And they're clearly very hard pressed. Uh, on average, they work four hours uh, over their contracted hours each week. And that's probably an underestimate. And the other thing about the specialist nurses we notice is that they are doing a large amount of admin work. Um, things such as data entry, arranging appointments and infusions for patients, arranging repeat prescriptions. And that could be done more cost effectively by having clerical support, freeing up our nurses to do what they're good at, which is dealing with patients and help them with their condition. The second area that we are wanting to focus on is clinical pathways, particularly rapid diagnosis. Um, calprotectin is already available in all areas of Wales in primary care. Uh, but I think there needs to be some uh, uh, focus on education in primary care, see how calprotectin fits in with the use of uh, quantitative fit testing, perhaps in older patients, and uh, a push towards uh, more direct to test uh, so that patients come straight up and have their colonoscopy if they've got obvious inflammation. But the diagnosis doesn't end with having a test and we still hear stories of patients who have their endoscopies are then told um, you've got colitis, uh, go away and wait for a referral. That's just not acceptable. And I think it's relatively straightforward to have an agreed local plan so that patients seen with a new diagnosis in an endoscopy unit or in other places can have some information straight away, either be seen there and then by somebody, or if not, to be given a phone number and have a call and a contact so that they know where to go and to get treatment started rapidly. Um, thirdly, uh, we've already heard a bit about personalized care plans and how vital they are for empowering patients. I think it's very important. It also empowers GPs so that patients can get standard treatments for flares from their GP and they don't always have to go to the IBD nurses. And lastly, data, critically important. We're very lucky in Wales. We have a, a Welsh clinical portal and behind that is a Welsh national data resource. We've been working on uh, IBD dashboards, which can present summary data. And we are working hard also to find a way to get patient level data into a national database that can be used both at point of care and for all the other things that we need to do with that data, particularly quality improvement. So I'm gonna stop, uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barney. Um, can we come now to uh, Scotland and Denise Aitken, who's National Improvement Advisor for Modernising Patient Pathways for the Scottish Government. And she's going to talk about their partnership approach to supporting self-management in IBD in Scotland. Hi, thank you. Um, just waiting for my slide. <laughs> Here we are. Thanks so much for inviting me along uh, this evening. Um, I have to point out before I start, this is a slightly modified presentation due to PERTA. Um, so um, apologies for that, but hopefully you'll find uh, what I do have to say um, interesting. So can you have the, the next slide, please? So just, just a little bit of background. The Modern Patient Pathways Programme um, is really focused on outpatients and covers a range of specialties, including gastroenterology. Um, the overarching aim uh, of the programme is really to create more efficient, effective and equitable pathways of care with the patient at the, at the centre. 
Um, so the background to the collaboration with Crohn's and Colitis stemmed from the blueprint, which was published in 2016. Led by Crohn's and Colitis and supported by Scottish Government and other key stakeholders, um, this really paved the way ahead and created the work plan for the IBD standards to be taken forward across Scotland. I think, you know, overall the relationship has been a positive one um, and a great example of uh, co-production, which I'm sure lots in the call involved will agree with. Um, also listed here, just on the left, are a few areas that, you know, of consideration stemming from that work plan and equally apply to the um, overarching aims of the, the Modernising Patient Pathways Programme too, um, and things that were considered as, as we've moved some of this, this work forward. Um, Three C's at the side there. I'm sure lots of you that are involved in redesign will be familiar with, with these. These are all, you know, fundamentally important for any service redesign. So we've really focused on those along with applying the principles of realistic medicine to, to drive forward uh, change. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, the, the working relationship being positive um, and the benefits of co-production and nothing illustrates that better than the, the FLAIR card. So we have a national steering group and that's made up of key stakeholders from across the health boards, uh, along with Crohn's and colitis and patient representatives. And through that collaborative working, obviously the FLAIR card has, has been um, created. Over 100 have been issued um, across Scotland and those boards that have, have um, adopted the, the FLAIR card so far. And, um, you know, some of these areas have put out questionnaires to patients. And I'm just going to quickly read off a couple of quotes by way of feedback um, about the FLAIR card that, that, that we've had through those questionnaires. So one was, it's really useful to know the different steps I need to take in terms of medication if I have a flare up. Another was very reassuring, helps you realise it's just a flare up and nothing more sinister. And uh, another one, um, it empowered me to self-manage. So to me, I think, you know, this is a great example of supported self-management and it works and it works well because it was co-produced. And I think we can see that through um, the feedback from, from the flare card from patients. And obviously there I've, I've got down that it did win the, the IBD Self-Management Award last year. Um, I think, you know, as I say, a good example of supported self-management because it's about um, activating the intervention. So it's the right person, right time, right place. Um, and I think that's key to success really. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, as it, as it says here, I mean, um, at the moment, next steps for us are dependent on, on the administration. Um, but I think obviously from the back of this report, I think that there's always going to be more work to be done. But I think it's about building on the, the successes to date and, you know, hope that we can continue. But our role will become more, more apparent once the new administration's in. So very short and apologies for that, but, but sort of limited. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Denise. If the new government in Scotland doesn't support you, we'll come up and sort them out. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Can we uh, go to Northern Ireland? Andrew Murdoch is a consultant gastroenterologist in the Southern Trust in Northern Ireland and chair of the Northern Ireland IBD Interest Group. And he's going to talk about priorities for IBD in Northern Ireland. Uh, good evening from Northern Ireland. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I know we in Northern Ireland are a comparatively small population, but one of the strengths of IBD UK is that everyone's voice is heard no matter where you're from. So I'd like to thank IBD for, for the invitation. I'm just going to mention three headline issues that I think will make a huge difference to IBD care in Northern Ireland. Could I have the, the next slide, please? Psychological support. Um, and the you know, it needs to be a routine part of the patient journey as set out in the standards. Whether you know, as an individual moving from paediatric to adult care, I've seen a lot of stuff in the chat, um, you know, the difficulties with that, dealing with previous surgery or, you know, managing the everyday challenges the disease presents and um, support is required. And the key word I put in this slide is routine. That, you know, this shouldn't be an in case of emergency break glass approach to, to mental health, but really integrated into everyday practice. One in four people with IBD will experience depression you know, in their lifetime. 
The IBD standards clearly state psychology is part of the core team. Nice stated BSG, ECHO, everyone states it. Yet, you know, as an everyday working gastroenterologist, I can't refer to psychology, you know, for my IBD patients. And that's really frustrating, um, as we know that intervention does work. To any health service managers out there in the audience, there's a great paper in Frontline Gastroenterology this year, which looked at integrating psychological support um, into everyday practice. Service utilization one year afterwards found reduction in outpatient appointments, high patient referrer satisfaction. Basically what I'm saying is it works and it pays for itself. Um, we in the IBD community in Northern Ireland would like, to th would like to thank Professor Siobhan O'Neill, who has written to our local health minister, Mr. Robert Swan, highlighting that any mental health plan locally must include IBD patients, as they often struggle to access early interventional services, really due to the sensitivity of, of the condition. You know, we simply can't keep on identifying the need and then ignoring it. We, we got to solve it, and we solve it, it's a win for everyone. Uh, could have the next slide, please? Better data. Um, you've already heard it mentioned tonight. When our IBD team, you know, we sat down to, to do our self-assessment questionnaire, the first question genuinely had a stumped. And it, you know, it wasn't asking, you know, how do we manage complex disease or what particular biologics we use? It simply asked, how many adult IBD patients does your service manage? How many inpatients has your service managed over the past 12 months? How many newly diagnosed IBD patients have you managed in 12 months? And due to the lack of an electronic IBD registry and clinical management system, the, the answers to these most basic demographic questions are, are estimates. You know, the, the standards state that all patients with IBD should be recorded into an electronic clinical management system and that data provided to the IBD registry. Better local data collected electronically would mean better management of services, which means better care. Now, this issue has been on the, on the table since the launch of the 2013 standards. We've had a number of false starts locally over the intervening years. Promisingly, um, through the work of, of Dr. Tony Tam and Ella Jameson, who's one of the project manage, managers at Encompass, our Ulster Society of Gastroenterology recently had a, a webinar looking at what a new um, electronic healthcare record called Encompass can achieve for IBD care. And I think hopefully this dialogue will continue, um, not only for our IBD um, patients, but the lessons learned can be transferable to other chronic disease states. Um, and our existing healthcare record in ACR, it, it, there's real opportunities there for patient portals, et cetera. So while we're Moving to a new system, I think we can still get great value from the old system, and that does need support. Could I have the next slide, please? Self-management. Self-management, it's, it's, it's not about abandoning people, it's about empowering people um, to control the condition and get the best quality of life. Um, and when you think about it, we really need self-management as part of healthcare because a patient with a chronic illness like IBD Maybe only see a healthcare professional for a few hours every year. The rest of the time, the person is on their own. They are self-managing. So, you know, we really need to empower folk to take an active role in their care. And that's giving information skills and confidence to self-manage while giving support when, when they need it. So in practice, that does mean a personalized care plan, including flare management individually tailored, you know, regular reviews and monitoring. The, the one size fits all approach no longer is, is fit for the 21st century. And it, it means everything I've mentioned in the last five minutes, psychological support, an electronic health care record with, with the patient portal for results and supporting document. It means being seen and treated as, a, as an individual. Um, all these headline aims are achievable. All trust IBD teams are ready to work and make this happen. So I hope this report serves as a launch pad to, to greater things in, in Northern Ireland. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was a, it was a great soapbox, without a doubt. We're going to open up to questions now, and poor Sarah Sleet is going to take over this section. And he has an unenviable task because we've got at least 33 questions in the Q&A and possibly more. Over to you, Sarah. 
Thank you for that. So yeah, Barbara and I are switching roles now, and um, I don't suppose we're going to be able to respond to all um, 33 questions. Um, but I'm going to start off with where we should always start with these things, with uh, the patient viewpoint. And Anisha, I just wanted to start off with asking you, um, what do you think will make the biggest difference in terms of your experience? So I think for me, what probably would have made the biggest difference right at the start back in 2008 was probably quicker diagnosis, which means that uh, the understanding of both primary and secondary care about IBD needs to be there. Mm. Um, and then access kind of following on from that and tied into that is access to specialised holistic services and very quickly because those two years where I was being pushed from pillar to post physically had a huge impact on me but mentally as well and and I think so much actually could have been avoided um, in those two years to have actually just gone through a very quick diagnosis I appreciate it's not always straightforward we can present with a variety of symptoms but I think that being taken seriously is really important. And that starts right from that presentation, most likely to your GP um, and, and having that understanding about, well, could it be IBD? If so, what's the pathway? What do we need to follow? Um, I've seen a lot of comments about mental health in the chat saying it's great to hear you know, that being talked about. So I actually work in mental health. Um, so I can see both sides of it where I'm seeing a lot of the IBD nurses saying, well, you know, we have so much work, we have to think about uh, callbacks and then something else has to give. So I'm actually on both sides as a patient and as a provider, and I completely understand the pressures that are there. Um, and that's why I think this report is so important, because actually this report looks at everything holistically, not just about what's required for the patients, but what can practically be implemented. And then I think the pathway, if you get a really good start right at the beginning with diagnosis, access to excellent services, the rest will follow. But if at the start it takes one, two, three, four, five years, numerous trips to A&E, already you're starting on a back foot of trying to manage this. So for me, fundamentally, I think that would have made a huge difference to how I progressed through my journey so far. Thanks for that. And um, I mean, that leads nicely on to a question, which is a pretty tough question, I think, for Barney, because um, you've you've laid out, Barney, where you would like to um, the actions to improve your services. You've identified diagnosis as one of the, the critical points that needs addressing. Um, I mean, in terms of the uh, whales, why, why do you think they're lagging behind at the moment on waiting times for referral and investigations? And, and what, what actions can you take to, to really hit that particular issue? Well, I think, I think these, are, these are problems that we face all across the UK. Um, but in Wales, certainly we've had problems um, historically. Um, numbers of colonoscopies per head of population have been significantly lower than other areas of the UK. And that is being addressed. There's now a national endoscopy program, and they're working very hard on that. Um, uh, regarding uh, surgery, um, surgery, surgery waiting times have been a bit longer as well, uh, based on the um, patient survey. Although, uh, interesting, the, the numbers were quite small, so not statistically significant. But as, as colorectal surgeon numbers have increased, my understanding is that in many areas, their theater capacity, you know, the number of lists that they can do each week has not risen the same. So that's good for emergency surgery because there are more people on the on-call rotors. But elective surgery um, is still a problem if you don't have the theater space to do the operations. One of the big moves which is being pushed hard now in Wales and across other parts of the UK is um, splitting elective from emergency care uh, in terms of surgery. And I think that's really important actually so that the elective um, lists are protected from the vagaries of winter pressures, emergencies, bed, bed blocking, you know, lack of beds to put people in, lack of ITU capacity. So those are some very practical things. But I think that the, the 
the, this survey, the, the benchmarking survey, has really highlighted what the patients feel about our services. And I think getting those messages up the line to, to our, um, our colleagues um, who run the health service in Wales is a big part of getting action. Thank you for that. Um, the impact of COVID, which I, I guess relates to some of that elective surgery um, new approach. Um, Barbara, just a question for you about um, what do you think governments can do to respond to, to resetting services in a better place post COVID? I think it's going to be quite tough for governments because the, the, the length of waiting lists is now so immense. Uh, but I really do think government has got to get some sort of action plan for um, A, resourcing and B, making happen uh, action in each health economy to, to, to tackle this issue. Otherwise, we'll just see people languishing on waiting lists forever. Uh, the other thing that I think um, governments need to be led to believe is really important is, is this business of comparative care across different parts of the country and within the countries and between the countries. I mean, there's a huge amount of good practice goes on, but it doesn't get adopted everywhere. And if we could even just get some simple um, standards for patient pathways, uh, early diagnosis, um, I mean, it's an outrage that some of the very good diagnostic tests are not being used. Um, and so um, the work that needs to happen is to, to shine a bright light, I think, on the, on the disparity between services uh, and, and really demonstrate to government that the answers are known. We know what a good service looks like. Uh, it's, it's implementation that's the problem. And um, Catherine, to you, um, thinking about resourcing, uh, you know, the government clearly has a major role in this, but equally NHS leaders and decision makers you know, are making decisions about priorities and where to spend those resources. Um, how do you th think we can best hold NHS decision makers to account in this? So I think if we had the answer to that one, uh, we'd all be going home happy tonight, Sarah. So I, I don't think it's an easy question. Um, in terms of of, of simplifying decision making. I think we can, if we start in the corner we most know, and that's the clinical decision making corner, then it's those clinical decision pathways through primary and secondary care at all the touch points by trying to make sure they are streamlined. So Barney's already given us an excellent example of when you attend for endoscopy, you may have a surprise diagnosis of IBD at that point. It is really unacceptable then to have to go back to the beginning of a referral pathway, which may see you waiting then up to 18 weeks to be seen. So it's about connecting what already provides us with that priority of streamlining and getting managers to see that the funding for that uh, is actually um, a, a cost saving for them because you have a single point of contact and onward referral rather than a circular referral pattern. So yes, simple protocols to both manage, inform and refer on straight from that single point of contact would be, I think, one way that you could hold, uh, hold the service accountable, but you can only do that if you get funding agreement across directorates and that's always the problem. Because it's like introducing fetal calprotectin in primary care, you're asking primary care physicians often to fund that service for, if you like, the streamlining of secondary care and then everybody gets very grumpy about that. So it's about thinking top line about how the patient becomes the focal point and the money follows the patient and the funding is for that patient's care. And perhaps, you know, the, the move to integrated care systems might, might help. Should give us, should give us an opportunity, but it needs, you've, in order for it to present the opportunity, you have to think about that streamlining and that confluence of care uh, yeah. before you re restructure the system. Thank you. Excellent point. Um, Andrew, there was, um, when you were talking particularly about the mental health issues associated with IBD, there were a lot of comments coming through. Thank goodness somebody's talking about this because it does so often um, get missed out. And um, often um, IBD nurses, specialist nurses, are a, a good 
kind of an entry point for those discussions, yet we know that there are too few out there. What do you think are uh, some of the barriers and how can we overcome the barriers to getting more nurses in the system and to getting more access to psychological support as well? Yeah, I had, I had seen a lot of stuff in the chat and somebody had made the point which I, I was, um, you know, came into my head whenever I was talking about it upskilling of, of all um, healthcare professionals involved in the IBD team. Um, and I include myself in that, um, you know, we really should be using every opportunity, whether it's a clinic, whether it's a helpline call, uh, whether it's an inpatient admission to, to, to promote well-being, ask about um, mental health issues, signposting people to, um, to, to help. Um, Again, sorry, I'm just going to get back in my soapbox locally. Um, you know, we in Northern Ireland do have a, a solution which is ready to ready to, to go regarding psychological help. Um, my colleagues in the northern in the Northern Trust, and I've seen a few people on chat from the, from that area, working with Mr. Michael Taylor, who's one of the senior commissioning um, managers in the health board. We actually have a, a you know a business case ready to go for a clinical psychologist to join the IBD team. And that would mean, you know, supporting approximately 60 referrals per year and that one trust alone, as well as developing and um, delivery of group interventions. So it's not just on the IBD nurses, it's, it's, it's the responsibility of everyone. But with this business plan, it would allow, you know, a dedicated support. And if, if that was funded and was successful, that could be ruled out through all the trusts in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, we would have an, an instant win for, for everyone. So um, apologies for crowbarring and an appeal for funding, but um, yeah, we every opportunity. Great. Well, uh, look to, forward to seeing that day. Thank you. Um, last question. We started um, with a question to um, our patient panellists. I think it's only right we should end with a question to our patient panellists. So, Anisha, um, how can we get um, patients with Crohn's and colitis more involved in designing IBD services and IBD research, you know, at a, at a ground level? Yeah, great question. Um, so it's great having opportunities like this, obviously, to, to kind of have a platform. Um, but we really need to think about the ground level in that you have such a diverse range of patients, uh, those who are very engaged, those who aren't. Um, and it's really thinking about what are the opportunities and how can, how can those patients engage with us, for example, as healthcare professionals, as charities. So there needs to be a point of contact everywhere. So whether it's at your GP and you're signposted to organisations, whether it's in secondary care and again, you're signposted to organisations, you're presented with research opportunities. Quite often what I found is that it's very dependent on whether your consultant or your hospital happens to be um, kind of at the forefront or engaged in these opportunities but actually all of this should be discussed at every point of contact because throughout our journey our willingness to engage can vary our ability to engage can vary and that's also really important that the opportunities that are presented for patients takes that into account um, I, I do a lot of, of kind of patient engagement and, and various things, not just Crohn's and colitis, but also around mental health. You know, that's that's kind of where I work. Um, but I so even tonight, it's great that this has been virtual. If I'd had to travel, for example, say into London for an event, I would have had to take tomorrow off work because I would not have been able to physically cope with my fatigue, for example. So making them accessible, making sure that they're diverse and looking at all the different areas. So clinical trials, for example, when they're being designed, you need patients involved right from the beginning stage around how to actually design the clinical trials to encourage patients to, to take part and also taking into account the diversity uh, element. So that's, you know, men, women, um, race, ethnicity, um, sexuality as well. So we know access to healthcare services by people um, uh, in the LGBTQ community, um, particularly mental health, um, is much lower than the average population. So we really need to be thinking about that.
but it needs to be at every point of contact. Patients should be get in, engaged, including uh, information, uh, so the health information. Are patients uh, being asked to review it? For example, does it make sense? Um, so there are so many opportunities, but it's actually quite easy to be able to say to patients, tell us what you think. Sometimes it can actually just start with a very basic conversation of asking the patient and listening to, to what they say. Um, and like I said, I often sit on the other side in my work. So I get the, the, the challenges in terms of time, but actually, and resources, but actually this is how we can progress our services. This is how we can save the NHS money in the long run. This is how we can support an aging population often now with comorbidities as well. It's, you know, the pressure is only gonna increase. That's why we need the funding and why we need the resources. But certainly patients need to be at the heart of everything we do because we will all be a patient at some point for something. And I think that's probably the key point to, to drive home that we will all be at some point. That's fantastic. Thank you, Anisha. Um, so I'm going to wrap up the session there. Thank you, everyone, to the questions uh, for the questions. They've been excellent questions. So sad we haven't been able to answer them all. Um, we could have hung on for the rest of the night, but perhaps not everybody else. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there and hand back to, to Barbara to, to wrap up the um, programme for tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's been a really good session. Um, some of the things that really have come over from me is the whole question of um, what Catherine called equity of access and um, and also the importance of that partnership between the person with uh, IBD and, and the multidisciplinary team. I must admit, when I was diagnosed, I had two lifelines. One was a good IDB, IBD nurse and and the other was um, Crohn's and Colitis UK, who were a beacon in the darkness in the early days. Um, I think also just thinking through the immediate future where we've got blockages in the system for diagnosis and for support. Um, I do think that we need some real pressure on governments across the four nations to demonstrate that a good patient care pathway is good for people with the condition, but also is probably cheaper than the multiple failures that we see in terms of communications and coordination uh, across care pathways that, that fail to function well for, for, for patients. So um, we've got the models, we've got uh, ways of making sure that people with uh, IBD can save what they want from the system. Uh, and the real challenge now uh, that I want to lay at every one of you's feet is uh, how you can use this report um, to really um, take forward the messages that it has revealed, the insights it's given and the data that it's based on uh, so that we can uh, move forward from, from the situation that has existed over a number of years with inadequate coordination and funding and uh, management of care. So if you're a healthcare professional, I want you to go and bang on the door of your senior manager or your commissioner uh, and present them with a report and tell them what you think they ought to do about it. If you're somebody uh, with IBD, uh, write to your MP or phone them up, go to one of their surgeries when we are allowed out. Uh, if you're a journalist and you're on the line, I want you to publicise this report and to press the solutions that it offers uh, and continue to do that over a concerted period of time. Uh, so the, the, this was really just an introduction to a piece of work that we can all jointly do, uh, and that bit of work starts now. So over to you to take forward these ideas. We will be there to help, but let's start an army for this revolution. And if I can now just pass over to Sarah to say goodbye tonight. Thanks, Barbara. And um, I've always um, seen myself as a revolutionary. So I love that thought. Take this forward as a revolution. We have to get change in IBD care. Um, thank you to everyone who's made tonight possible, um, particularly all of the uh, people who have taken part in the audit. 
uh, IBD UK collaborating organisations. We couldn't have got here without the passion and commitment of all of you guys. Thank you to everybody who's attended today. Um, like Barbara says, if um, you know, uh, go out and do one action. If everybody went out and did one action, we've got the chance of creating a tsunami for change. And thank you very much to Barbara for giving up your time and, and sharing us so beautifully tonight as well. Um, we will be appearing on YouTube forevermore, apparently, until we all fall off our perch. So you can see us there if you want to point, uh, point the session to anybody going forward. Lots of um, guidance and advice been given out on chat about how to get in touch with MPs. Um, and I think that will be enough for tonight. But we will be back and we will be pushing the message again. Thank you, everyone, for your time and your commitment. Bye bye.